We're going to read from Acts chapter 13, and we're just going to read, I've got a, a small paragraph, a chunk of a paragraph, it's only three verses, we're going to read that this morning. Acts chapter 13, from the word of God, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for them, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And so reads the word of God which we are going to consider in a few moments. I returned once to a garage to collect my car, only to be told, you can't take this car away. It's a death trap. The dreaded MOT. <laughs> Anyone with a car that's maybe five years old or more, maybe even less, dreads that yearly uh, trip to their garage. Uh, the MOT time, the MOT is due. Who likes the MOT? Not anyone I know. We sometimes find, don't we, as we get to middle age, we say we sometimes find, as you get to middle age, there is the offer of a regular health check. I don't know if it's something like every five years, you can go and have certain things um, offered to you. If you uh, haven't had this yet, you'll be getting it soon as you're getting into that bracket <laughs> and they check your blood pressure. Uh, that which caused uh, my father one time to uh, almost run out of the doctor's surgery because he didn't want them. He wanted a flu jab, but he didn't want his blood pressure taken. <laughs> so he came out uh, as quick as he possibly could. But one of the things they do in a health check is check your pulse. Check your pulse. What's your pulse like this morning? Obviously, if you're calm and relaxed, uh, they're wanting to see a, a nice slow pulse, on. But if I say, what about your spiritual condition? What's your spiritual pulse like? We're looking there, not for a slow one, though we are in certain areas. We're looking more for one that is beating fast, a fast pulse. A slow pulse when it comes to all the dangers and troubles, because uh, the one with a slow pulse, spiritually speaking, is confident that the Lord is with us. The Lord is our guide. The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our shade, as it were. He's our shelter. Shelter. He's our refuge. So there's a slow athlete's pulse. But when we come to, as we consider in these verses, of the church on the mission, Oh, that's where the pulse should be racing. And so the question and the challenge for us this morning, do we have racing pulse? When we consider a spiritual health check, if we have certain issues and struggles, the Lord puts pastors into churches. And we can go to pastors, can't we, with our spiritual concerns, our spiritual issue. But it's also good to individually and sometimes collectively as a church where it's possible to take time away to take time out from all the goings on in the world and just to get alone with the word of god and before the lord listen it's good to do that spiritual health check when we last have such a health check spiritual if we're part of the Lord's church, he puts us into churches. So we say we're part of the Lord's church. We're not saved to be in isolation. We're saved to be part of a local church. And one of the responsibilities, one of the blessings of being part of a local, local church is that we watch out for one another. We pray for one another. We watch over one another as to our spiritual condition. We come together regularly to hear the word of God. And what the Lord often does through his word is a rest, a spiritual decline or a spiritual slide, let's say, 
before it gathers pace and becomes a free fall. That's what he does, doesn't he, through his work? During the lockdown, one of the things that was said was that MOTs could be suspended for up to six months. Were you relieved by that? I was. I was relieved by that. But it wasn't a relief because, oh, I don't have to go to a mechanic who might pass on a virus. No, it was a relief because the consequences of a failed MOT could be put off for six months. And a big bill could be put off for six months. If I said last week in leading the meeting that, oh, next Sunday, be there because we're going to be challenged concerning our zeal for mission, our passion for evangelism, and our desire to witness to a lost world. If I'd announced that last week, what would have been our reaction? Mine might well have been, hmm, can I get another pastor to, to preach that? And I can pretend I'm preaching somewhere else. Would yours have been, well, hmm, I can feel a, a, maybe I've got a cold coming. And it wouldn't do to go to church and spread germs around others. So maybe I'll stay away too. You see, the verses before us, they confront our zeal for mission, our passion for evangelism. They ask the question, do we have zeal? Do we have passion? Do we have a desire to witness? What's our pulse for evangelism? What's our pulse like this morning? You play the game of Monopoly. And what's one of those cards when you land on chance that is a good one to pick up? Get out of jail free. And it's as though some Christian people would say, ah, I've got a get out of jail card. It doesn't apply to me. What you're about to say doesn't apply to me. I've got a slow pulse. A slow pulse. And I need to keep it that way. And one of the things, and I start with this as a heading, that people would say, here's my get out of jail card. It doesn't apply to me. Is this and it's a bit heavy? Salvation is the work of God. That's true, isn't it? Salvation is the work of God. It, it's all his work. So, ah, here's my get out of jail card. Here's my get out of evangelism card. Let's call it that. I've got one of those because it's all God's work. It's not for me to do it. It's not for you and I. You look at Antioch, the church at Antioch. The church at Antioch, there in chapter 11, let me just, uh, some of them in verse 20, uh, the, these are missionaries really, effectively, aren't they? They're, they're going round and they're proclaiming the good news. Some of them went from, uh, to Cyprus, uh, from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch, 1120, and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So ignoring that first part that they went there and did that, look at the second part. A great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. You see, it's the Lord's work. There's revival going on at Antioch. When Barnabas goes there and he gets Saul to help him, it's amongst the Christian people, but others are coming in. They're flooding in to the church. Uh, they're like those on the day of Pentecost. When Peter uh, is to preach that first sermon on the day of Pentecost, what happens? The people come running, not because Peter's preaching, but the Lord sends them. There's this noise. And there's this uh, sound of people speaking in all sorts of different languages. And the people come running because they say, what's going on here? They come flooding, as it were, to hear. You see, it's all God's work. Therefore, what we need to do is be praying for that, praying for revival. That's what we were doing yesterday, some of us. 
And if you weren't there, I'm sure you were joining when you could in prayer for revival. And I'm sure, as we were exhorted yesterday, we don't just kick it off. It's uh, 12 o'clock now on a Saturday, so it's go time to watch the football or go shopping or go ice skating or something. No, we, all of us, do we not feel a burden? For the need of our day that the Lord would revive his church. But you see, some would say, well, this is our get out of evangelism card. I'll get out of witnessing card because it's all the Lord's work. We need to pray for revival. Shut the doors, get on our knees, pray for revival, and see what the Lord will do. Salvation is the work of God. He has his elect. He alone knows whom he's going to save. Therefore, we don't need to. There's a man by the name of William Carey, who is known as the father of the modern missionary. And when he went with a burden for the lost in other parts of the world, and he eventually went to India, didn't he? When he went with a burden before these eminent theologian men, pastors, and who were leading churches, and he said, shouldn't we be doing something about the loss in these uh, other parts of the world where the gospel has never been proclaimed? What did they say? These champions of the faith, they said, sit down, young man. If God wants to convert the heathen, that's what they called them, if God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it. He doesn't need you. You see, that's the thinking of some people. There's my get out of evangelism. It's God's work, not ours. We don't want to get into the way or in the way of what he's doing. We don't want to quench his spirit. But what does the Holy Spirit say? The Holy Spirit says here in verse 2: set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And what is that work? That work is to go and look for souls. See, save the lost. That's the work. And when they do so, the Holy Spirit will be working in them and through them. They were to be souls of the word of God. George Whitfield, he believed very much that salvation was a work of God when he was preaching one time the gospel and a drunk man came forward and said, that man converted me. Whitfield said, I don't doubt that I did. It's sure, we can be sure and certain, the Lord certainly didn't, because if he converted you, salvation is a work of God. If he converted you, you wouldn't be like that now. You see, when man works and man does his conversion, as you see uh, in many things today, they call them rallies, they call them revival meetings, they call them all sorts of things. They might call them a dance and so forth today. Where everyone gets all excited and then there's some kind of altar call or whatever and people come forward and say some kind of prayer. Does that change anything? The Lord can work in that for sure. I'm not doubting that. But does that change anyone? Can I change anyone by doing that? If I slapped... Dear Michael, well in the face, I can get a reaction from him. He's either going to hit me back or he's going to be scared of me and run, probably the former, but he's, he's not going to get a reaction. It's easy to get an emotional reaction. But then, brothers, we considered recently the Holy Spirit works on the understanding to give you a clear understanding that you're a sinner and that you need a savior because you've got to answer to God for your sins. You understand, and it's not to be put in a well, all sinners and people and short of the glory of God, you must believe on the Lord. It's not to be put in a, a plain fashion like that, though it can be. It is to be put with searching and with stirring and with a, a heart that, that, that has experienced that in itself and can say to you, Look, this is what you need. And that stirs the emotions. The emotions should be stirred. Through the understanding of, oh, this is my plight. And then the will is then moved, isn't it? To say, this is what I must. I must come to Christ. I must have Christ. Can Christ be for me? And that's what the Holy Spirit does. But he does it through us. He does it through the church. And so there's Carey being told, let the Lord do his work. There's our get out of evangelism card. He uses us. He uses us. 
And so Mr. Evangelism Park says, well, of course he uses us. And that's what we need to do is to pray for God to bring people to us. Oh, we mustn't go looking for them. This game will get in the way of the Holy Spirit. But look what's taking place here. Set apart from the Barnabas and saw for the work which I have called them to. And as they go, as souls, the Lord will be working through them. Whitfield believed in the sovereignty of God. He was a sower, wasn't he? He was a sower. Many would say he's the greatest sower of the word that this country has ever produced in terms of sowing the seed of the gospel. And experiencing, because of the Lord's blessing upon him, a rich harvest of souls being drawn into the kingdom of God. What about Calvin? Oh, quickly say Klein. Quickly say Klein. Otherwise, it's for many, even who call themselves Christian, if you name the name Calvin and you don't mention Klein afterwards, it's a swear word. A swear word. But let me tell you, John Calvin believed very much that salvation is the work of God. And yet in the archives in Geneva are hundreds of letters. They remain. And how many more were written? Hundreds of letters that were sent into troubled France with advice from John Calvin for the small number of Christians there on establishing underground churches. Underground. That means hidden, doesn't it? What were these Christians hidden? <laughs> Listen to this. Under Calvin's influence in 1555, there were five known churches in France. Five known churches that would preach the gospel. I'm not talking about Roman Catholicism. That's a cult or that's a sect or whatever you want to call it. That's not the truth. There were five. Seven years later, how many do you think there were? From five in seven years. 150. 150 from five in seven years. That's incredible, isn't it? Don't you think? Oh, no, wait a minute. Oh, I've missed a bit. There was a 150, but there's something in front of it. 2,150. I'll give you the cubicles. Over 3 million French people, it is uh, believed, were attending one of these underground churches. Uh, seven years, so that's six, seven, uh, 1562. By 1562, something like 3 million of the population of France, I don't know what the population of look it up, was in those days, but well, maybe a lot more. Maybe it's double that, I don't know. Whatever it is, the Lord is working. The Lord is working. So give me that get out of evangelism card. It, it doesn't apply. You can't use that and say evangelism's not for me. You can't use it on what basis? On the basis of scripture. Because scripture gives us Matthew 28, 18 to 20, gives us the great commission to go into all the world. All the world. And let me read it to you from Mark's Gospel, at the end of Mark's Gospel. Verse 15 of chapter 16, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Don't be picky, don't be choosy. Hmm, don't like them, they look a bit dangerous. Don't like them, they look a bit too posh. Where were I sent you? Go into all the world. Preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Yes, we are to pray for opportunities. But we are together with praying for opportunities. We have the great commission. That is the church's great task. To proclaim the gospel. The church's great task is so, well, I was going to say sad, but pathetic is probably more of an apt word. On Christmas Day, when you hear the Archbishop's message, and it's something about uh, some trouble somewhere or, or, or economic things, that, yeah, these things are, are a problem and these things need addressing. But 
Here's a man who allegedly is ordained with the gospel. What is what are we commemorating on Christmas Day? We're commemorating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's not biblical to have Christmas Day, but it's a, a good day to do, isn't it? It's a good thing to do to remember the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and to use it as an opportunity to tell people. He came into this world that you, a sinner, might have life. And as believers, we are to go looking for the lost. Whether they believe or not, it is not our responsibility whether they believe or not. Let me read you these words. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin. For his blood. That was said to his evil. But if you do not warn, sorry, but if you do warn the wicked man and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die. God doesn't promise to serve, save everyone, does he? He will die for his sin. You will save yourself. You would have carried out your commission and proved by that that you are a child of the Lord Jesus Christ if you bring in New Testament teaching. If we're not doing that, what does it say? about our spiritual condition what does it say about my heart what does it say about your heart this morning the book of acts is the disciples of the lord jesus christ living for christ living out their faith and in doing that central to that is witnessing carrying out the great commission they had again their commission didn't they they had it again right at the beginning of acts and it's probably the key verse aside from the day of pentecost it's probably the key verse in acts you will be receive power when the holy spirit comes on you. you'll be my witnesses jerusalem judea samaria to the ends of the earth acts 13 is the beginning of to the ends of the earth and as we considered, I think it was last time, the Acts 29, which of course isn't there, but it's here today. It's us continuing to spread the good news to the ends of the earth. How's our spiritual condition? On a scale of one to 10, where are we? Where are we? In terms of zeal, we're not talking about holy living now, though that is part of it, isn't it? We're talking about our zeal for the loss. Yes, the Lord has his elect, but he uses us. He uses our efforts to bring his people to salvation. Then we can say, secondly, if we uh, put up this card of uh, get out of evangelism card and say, one, salvation is the work of God, we can say, secondly, that, well, what do we see of the Christians in Antioch? We see, secondly, a zeal for service, a zeal for service. It's jumping off the page. Here in verse one, we, we have a, a diverse, we see there's a diverse community. It mentions these uh, leading men, these prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, uh, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, and Saul. And they're a diverse bunch, aren't they? Because uh, Barnabas, well, we know, we've met him before. Barnabas, he, he's, that wasn't his real name. He's, he's been given that name because he's an encourager. And Barnabas means son of encouragement. And every church needs their Barnabases, don't they? Barnabases and Barnab Barnabases. <laughs> Men and women who are encouragers, to encourage uh, the, the, the church, as it were. But Barnabas is a Levite from Cyprus. Simeon. Simeon, it's argued whether this is true or not, we'll wait till we get to glory to find out, but it's argued that Simeon goes as also being Simon, and Simon was the one who uh, carried the cross, was made to carry the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to the Mount of Crucifixion. And it's also suggested that here, whether it's he's that one or not, uh, called Niger, that tells us that he is from North Africa. And even if he wasn't 
that uh, Simeon, and even if he wasn't from North Africa, Manaean, sorry, Lucius certainly was because Cyrene is part of Northern Africa. And Manaean, he was raised in a royal household. Look, he was brought up in country. He was raised in a royal household. And then, of course, there's Saul, isn't there? Saul. More on him another time. But, but just that little snippet there, it, it shows us the diversity that's there in Antioch. And you can imagine, I, I think, when I first mentioned Antioch in a sermon, we, we called it, the, or I called it, uh, and you heard me say it, uh, the, the, a cosmoto the first cosmopolitan church. A cosmopolitan, people from all over, is it? All walks of life, all, all um, parts of the, the world, as it were, the known world at that time. Not unlike a large inner city today, is it? Not really. What unites them? They're all different. Rich, poor amongst them. What unites them? Highly educated, uneducated. What unites them? Slaves, free men. What unites them? They have one thing in common. They've been set free from sin. They've been restored to God. They know the Lord Jesus Christ. And with one voice jumping off the page, though it's not mentioned there, but you, it's jumping off the page for me, and I want it to be jumping off the page for you too, as you read what they're doing, one voice is jumping, or one word is jumping off the page, which is knowing Christ, there's more than one word, knowing Christ, it's the greatest thing. Being set free from sin, it's the greatest thing that's happened to me. Being restored to God, it means I've got everlasting life. And I can know Christ now, and I can serve Christ now, and I can live for Christ now. And the result of that is a zeal. A zeal for, yes, for living for Christ. But here our focus, and it is for living for Christ, in you, that you do this, a zeal for reaching the lost. They need to know what I know. Because I was like that. I was held fast in sin. But Christ has set me free. He set me free. Me, I want to argue with Paul. I'm the chief of sinners. He set me free. They look pretty bad, don't they? But he, he can set them free as well. He set whomsoever shall call, he can set free. We have that responsibility to go and tell that. Salvation is the work of God, but it doesn't stop the church in its mission, does it? In fact, it enhances the zeal of the church. True understanding of the sovereignty of God. Look at George Whitfield again. Look at John Calvin again. A true understanding of these things, like a Spurgeon in mind. True understanding of these things enhances the zeal of the Christian because the Christian can go in confidence knowing that the Lord has his people. He can go in confidence. It's his work we're undertaking. It's his cause. So let me ask, how's your pulse? How's your pulse? When it comes to confidence in the Lord, is it a nice slow pulse? When it comes to zeal for him, is it bouncing up and down ever so fast? Can a man really be a woman? I'll tell you what, a sinner can be a saint. That's true. That's true, isn't it? And the saint says, Christ is all. I live for Christ. My heart beats for souls. Ooh. See why it's better to have someone else come and preach this? Because I can be somewhere else and not hear this because that's a challenge. Oh, it's so easy to say, oh, my heart beats for soul. Does yours and turn it on you. But come on, preacher. It applies to you as well. It applies to each one of us. Don't switch off. Don't close your eyes. Don't fall asleep. It applies to you. It applies to me. Can it be said that our heart beats for souls? That's a challenge. That's a challenge. And tonight, if we say this morning we, we fail that test, tonight I want to give an encouragement to, to be able to overcome that thing and to recover the zeal for serving the Lord. But 
the Lord Jesus Christ, his focus in life was what? Father's will. Father's will. Came to do the Father's will. And what did he say? Quoting from the psalm, zeal for your house, zeal for your glory. Consumes me. Consumes me. Paul sort of said something similar, didn't he? He said, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Zeal for your house consumes me. And the saint, if you're a saint, an eye to the Lord. Hand to the truck. Hands, as it were, looking to the Lord, the hand being uh, the body, as it were, going in the, the voice, as it were, proclaiming what you see, proclaiming what you understand, proclaiming you need Christ, you need a Savior. In verse 2, we read there while they were worshiping the Lord, we looked at it two weeks ago, and, and I put to you that even though the ESV says worshiping, the word is ministry, not used many times this particular Greek word in the New Testament, but each time it's used, it's used of ministry. And it's not just talking about uh, leading a worship service. It's, it's talking about ministry, and it can be uh, in all manner of ways. But if we take that word and we think of it in terms of uh, the church gathered together and they're ministering to the saints for their needs, as it were. Here they are. They've got a large church. Barnabas and Saul are pretty well known locally now and these others are prophets and teachers so they've got a good reputation a good name people uh, draw to, to listen to their words and so forth it's going really well but they're not content they're not content they're like jehu who says to uh, i've forgotten the name of the one he says it to now but he says come up here come up here and let me show you my Zeal for the Lord. Come and see my zeal for the Lord. Christ is His zeal for the Lord. And here, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, fasting, there with the fasting, this is where I want to take us because there with the fasting, there's the display of their zeal they're going about their service to the lord amongst the saints these leading men as it were but as they do so they're fasting why are they fasting they don't need to the church is being blessed they've got all manner of people coming in they're not having to go out and say come on please come to church today save your soul or, or whatever they're not having to do any of that people are coming to them and yet they're zealous and that zeal comes out through the fasting they want lord more, Lord, and your cause, Lord, your direction, Lord, your leading, Lord. You told us to go into all the world. Is now the time? We're in a place called Antioch. Seleucia is not so far away. Uh, that's, uh, it becomes like gateway to the Mediterranean world. We can jump on a ship from there. We can go to Cyprus. We can go off you know, to Spain. Maybe to Spain, maybe for Saul of the years then. Has a kind of an income for Spain already. I don't know. But the fast thing I put to you is a display we can read into that. Their zeal, their zeal for the Lord. It's not some kind of religious duty that we must do. It's, not that. it's a hunger for direction and for the Lord's blessing. Ah, oh, says the man with the get out of witness car. You've said it several times. They were the leaders. It's the leaders that are fast. Really? Really? Just the leaders? Here, here's a thriving church. Do they? Just sit back, the rest of the congregation, and leave it to them at the front? Do they just sit back? Are they not too burdened with that great commission? If one of those leaders is burdened with it, which all five are, by the way, if one of them's burdened with it, you can be sure they'll unburden their burden and say, here, you have some of that as well. Not because I don't want it, because I want you to have it too. This is our cause. This is what we're here for. So the church is burdened. And it's our burden. It should be our burden because it's the church's burden in every generation. It's to go. Go and make Christ known. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be remarkable to be living in times of revival? And let's turn an illustration on its head because this illustration actually caused people to uh, run out of the church building. But that was because they feared a flood because they were so gripped by the preacher 
and the Lord using that preacher to describe uh, the, the, the wrath that was coming, as it were, they actually ran from the church. But let's turn it on its head. Imagine the Holy Spirit so inspiring the preacher. And he's saying to the church of the need to, to reach the lost. And then suddenly he says, go. And everyone leaves their seats and flies out the door because they've got this burden too. And they say, oh, we've got to tell the world. Tell my lethargy. I know it's warm. We should be zealous, shouldn't we, for the Lord's work. That burden is it ours to go and make Christ known. I put to you their fast here is a fast for the advance of the gospel. But for the gospel to advance, what does a church do? Before the gospel can truly advance, or we can uh, have a some kind of funny meeting and get a good band or whatever, but if we want true advance of the gospel, true advance of the church, the church must first be on its knees. Perhaps for this generation, we need to be on our face. On our faces, on the dirt, as it were, pleading with the Lord. And as we plead, as we seek the Lord for our generation, for the gospel to advance in our land, here, the rumbling tongues should be crushed, shouldn't it? The rumbling tongues, they're like a prayer added to those prayers. They can't be praying here, those leading, because they're ministering. But I think what's going on here is a, a wholehearted a, a service of prayer, ministering the word and singing and so forth. But their fasting is like a prayer in itself. The rumbling tongues are like a prayer. And it's a prayer that says, oh, Lord, Lord, that hunger that I feel here, it's my hunger for the lost. It's my hunger for your glory. And part of what will be said tonight will be just that, that fasting. Fasting is a pathway, a pathway to rekindle that hunger, rekindle kindle, uh, that desire for the glory of God. Was it just five who were fasting? a major decision that the church is about to undertake a church taking a, undertaking a major decision they're going to call a pastor going to call a pastor you wouldn't just do that with the elders and deacons if you've got elders and deacons in the church it's the whole church isn't it the whole church comes together how many churches today fast and pray over the matter of a pastor how many do they? get out of jail get out of evangelism it doesn't apply it doesn't apply. They're leading the church. The church is gathered. They're fasting. They're hearing the word. And they're in prayer. They have a zeal for the service of the Lord. And their cry is, Lord, what would you have us do? It's the cry of the whole church. Their pulse is racing. While they were worshipping the Lord. And fasting. You see the importance that fasting shows something of the importance. Do we see that importance? How's that a sorry? What's our spiritual pulse? <clears throat> this morning, my throat. Went. And then, thirdly and finally, it'd be this that um, two were set apart. Two were set apart. Question mark. Two are set apart, question mark, because is it really only two? You see, here's my get out of evangelism card, only two that are sent. Okay, I can join in prayer. I'm one of the church of Antioch, but it's only Barnabas and Saul, it's not me. Here's my get out of evangelism. But you see, give it here. I'm going to tear it up because all are called, all are set apart by the Lord. We are holy unto the Lord. We're set apart for the Lord, by the Lord, and yes, we're to live holy lives for the Lord, but we're also set apart to be witnesses, to carry out that great commission. Whether we're called, whether we're called to another land, whether we're called to another town, to another village, whether it's to stay here. If we were a Christian, the great commission is a major part of our calling. The Christian faith is a missionary faith. 
you might say, as a bird flies. It's natural for a bird to fly, isn't it? So a Christian gives testimony. As a bird flies. Put it on a par with a Christian giving testimony. It's a natural, it's a natural thing. Because you want to tell out your soul the wonders of his grace. I know we are all beset by fears and things, but this uh, part of the reason I believe the Lord leading me this way is to, to say to us, come on, let's overcome our fears. Do we not value the good news? As a bird flies, so a Christian gives testimony. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Sent them off. Sent them off. They did something about it. They were zealous. Lord, we want to do your will. We want to know what your will is. Well, my will is this. Take those two and set them apart for the work which I have them for. They carry on fasting. They carry on praying. Surely what they're doing then is they're commending them. They're committing them to the work, aren't they? And note that. There's, is there five leaders in Antioch? We very quickly gather that Barnabas and Saul, who becomes Paul, are probably the greatest leaders there, if I can use that word. And yet the church is willing because the Holy Spirit is telling them, the church is willing to say, okay, our two best men, off they go. Off they go. That's generous, isn't it? But you see, it comes because they've got a zeal for the gospel. They've got a zeal for the loss. They're all right, even if they get second-rate teaching from Manea, if that was so. It doesn't matter. Their souls are saved. What about the loss? What about the loss? Are we... Be doing something about it. Would we be willing to leave all and go? We know not where. We know why, don't we? We know why. We have a, a missionary family that we follow and support. Uh, the Saywells, they went, didn't they? They went. You don't do that unless you're fully convinced. Fully convinced if you're going to leave uh, uh, one country or home and go to another country with the prospect that you may never return again. You don't do that if you're convinced, one, that it's the Lord's calling for sure. But before that, and even more importantly, you only do that if you're convinced that the message is true. That it's transformed your life. Do you believe the gospel, the gospel? Do you believe the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you convinced of it? Or are you someone who says, nah, it's not true. It's not true. Well, the question then becomes, are you convinced? Are you convinced it's not true? Are you willing to die believing it's not true? Are you absolutely convinced? If not, then it's just a gamble, isn't it? It's a gamble. Very soon, you'll find out that gambling doesn't pay. Not when it comes to yourself. Gambling doesn't pay when the world is surrounded by gambling. You can't watch sport on the television without advert after advert of gambling and so on. Maybe gambling is so Those Christian people, they're very zealous, but not interesting. Are you convinced that those Christian people are wrong? Ren, fair enough. If you are, go your way. But you will have to give an account to the Lord. But if you're not convinced, is that a gamble really worth taking? For those of us who say, ha, it's no gamble for me, I am Christ. He is mine. How's your pulse? How's your pulse? How's your spiritual condition? Perhaps you're down as a Christian, down in a dumps as it were. One of the reasons why, maybe it's the main reason why, that you're down in a dumps while you're feeling low as a Christian is because you're not attempting what you've been saved for. You see, as we witness, as we speak out for the Lord or we seek those opportunities, so the Lord increases our zeal. So the Lord increases our joy. It's one of the wonderful things, isn't it? You share with someone something of your testimony, and it's the greatest, it's the greatest thing you feel you can do. 
And when you're not doing that, when it's all stifled and stunted through fear or whatever it might be, we become down, don't we? Because we know we're meant to. But it seems like a, a task that is insurmountable. That should drive us to our knees, as the hymn writer said, shouldn't it? To ask the Lord to help us in these things. We say, give us a sight, O Savior. For the greater the sight we have of him, the greater will be our zeal. Ooh, says someone, well, I, I, I'll stay, I'll stay short-sighted then. I don't want to have to be doing that kind of thing. I want to be able to use my get out of evangelism. Really? Really? There was a young girl who uh, was giving testimony before her baptism. And she was asked if her friends knew that she was a Christian. And this is the mentality that she'd been taught. And this is the mentality of many today. One of my friends dropped me in it. As though if I could escape from telling my friends that I'm now a Christian and I'm going to be baptized, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Peace. But no, someone dropped me in it. And now I've got warfare, I've got hostility. Hey, you're a Christian. Here comes that Christian and so forth. But you see, when we get our sight right, we have a new vision of Jesus when Christ is all. Those things don't matter, do they? They don't matter. Now I live for him. Do you have a heart for Christ? That's the one who's zealous for Christ, has a heart for Christ. In Mark chapter 8, let me just read you these words. Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him and come to his Father's glory with his holy angel. A person doesn't have, who says I'm a Christian, but doesn't have a heart to witness for Christ, it's ashamed of Christ, ashamed of his words. In an adulterous and sinful generation, Christ is going to come. Christ is going to come. What's going to happen? You'll be ashamed of such a one. You wouldn't stand for him. He gives us everything we need. He gives us the Holy Spirit. Surrounds us with angels. And beneath are the everlasting arms. As we were reminded the other day. He will say to the enemy, the hostility before us. He'll hold us up. He'll undergird us. If you're convinced this is true. Maybe you have to stay where you are, as it were. You're not to go off over the seas, but we're still to go, aren't we? We're still to go. And as we do, we may lose all that we have. But before Christ, we will wear a victor's crown. Back to the Remembrance Day, Lord Kitchener. Your country needs you. The Lord doesn't need us, but he uses us. He calls us, doesn't he? He calls us to undertake to carry out his sovereign will. Many wars are not necessary. Many are, tragically, but many are not necessary. But ours, our spiritual warfare, it is necessary. We are to rescue. We're to go and seek the lost. Do we have a missionary zeal? Do we have a missionary faith? Do we have a, a racing pulse? Do you seek to stir your heart through reading good Christian literature in order to increase your zeal for the Lord? Away with the negative. Get out of jail. Away with that. It's the most wonderful calling, isn't it? The most wonderful calling. A true saint does count the cost. A true saint says, cost? What cost? A little bit of hostility. It's worth it. It's worth it for me to live is Christ. Christ is all. What's more? Burning within is a zeal and a passion and a desire for the lost. And if it's not there, we need to plan it to be there, don't we? After they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them. And sent them off. They had come to the light 
And now they were willing, they were desiring to take that act, knowing that Christ would be with them, knowing that underneath were the everlasting arms. And no, just as I can tell you today, that we, as were they, are on the victory side. Amen. Amen.